Hello everyone, my name is Marty and today is the 16th of May and we are speaking about Neptune part two out of the blue and let me go ahead and go to my screen share. And um, here we have our screen, our presentation. And we're talking about Neptune and the human resonance today. And thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Um, let's see, today is, a, is, is pre-recorded, so you won't be able to join us. But uh, thank you for dropping by. And um, I thank all the students that are here students of EA and students of um, this forum. And I thank all of my fellow colleagues and astrologers. I learned something from you new almost every day. You're incredible and you know who you are. And many thanks to Linda for making this all happen. Um, we're so grateful to you, Linda, for helping everyone out and following your vision and your, your truth and, and your, your direction. Thank you for this forum. It's really tremendous, a real meeting of minds. And thank you to Jeffrey Wolf Green and his daughter, Deva. So again, today we're talking about Out of the Blue, part two. I did part one in September, and we talked about the quantum narrative. And I'd really like to invite you to watch uh, Out of the Blue, part one, um, to even if you just watch the beginning of it, so you understand what we're talking about quantum theory and quantum mechanics and how that applies to quantum consciousness and how that relates to the planet Neptune and evolutionary astrology. Um, because I can't get to that in this lecture. So if you are curious or feel like you're missing something, um, please check out the first part of Out of the Blue. Uh, I have been a counseling evolutionary astrologer for 26 years. I first started studying with Jeffrey in 94 and working with him and working on video and audio productions. I'm an astrologer and a medium. Um, I'm available for readings. Um, my website is simple. It will be at the end of the presentation as well. But it's just my name, Marty, M-A-R-T-Y, uh, last name Dixon, D-I-X-O-N dot com. I'd be very happy to hear from you. Uh, let's see. Let's, let's, let's proceed. Um, this is a anonymous quote, and it reads, the mind, I'm worried, the heart responds, just relax. The mind says, but I'm totally lost now. The heart says, just follow me. The mind says, but you've never been there before. The heart says, trust me, you'll love it. And the soul responds, if you two would just shut up, I'd show you the map. Now, we do have a map of the human soul. It's called an astrological natal chart. And it is just that. It shows us the, um, the pattern of our beginnings, the pattern of our origins. It's a blueprint for our life. And it continues to unfold like, um, like a blossom, like a petal, like the sacred geometry over time, based and predicated on the patterns that we first came in on. And the question of astrology that always arises in readings is, why, did I, why was I born when I did? Why did I come when I did to the land that I came to? And that's all because we, we choose our time when the aspects are right, when the stars are in the right place. We know what we're doing. We've been here before. It's all a very karmic journey. And we know about the people that we know that are significant to us represent, a, represent about 97% of, uh, of people that we've known before. So we travel on the same bus, so to speak. We travel in tribes. We travel in relationships. We travel in families. Um, we travel together. We've been here many times before. We recognize each other and we'll all come back again someday on the same boat. So what is human resonance? I'm going to go as quickly as I can through some of these slides because um, when I looked at them, they were very laborious and I don't want to do that to you. But real quickly, human, humans have a measurable um, vibratory level. Uh, a, a measurable frequency. It is, in, it is electrical in nature. And human resonance is the measurement of those frequencies, which are called um, extremely low frequencies or ELFs. 
And you can measure the electromagnetic frequency of, our, of the body's energy fields in different capacities. And then I just want to skip to um, the part that says your natural resonant frequency matches that of the earth itself. Um, there's a, such, a, such a phenomenon as is called the Schumann resonance. And the Schumann resonance was um, discovered and chronicled by a man in the 1950s who found that there's a zone between the Earth's, um, in, in the Earth's atmosphere, right above the Earth's surface and on up into the ionosphere that um, harbors frequencies that, can, that are very low, but that can be measurable. And this is the, um, the part of, the, or of our atmosphere, by the way, where lightning strikes and forms. And much like a musical instrument, these frequencies resonate with the natural harmonics of the planet, meaning there are natural frequencies that, that rise and fall with the electromagnetic um, um, powers that are right above the Earth, the electromagnetic conduct conduction of electricity above the Earth. And these rise and fall with certain atmospheric conditions, of course, thunderstorms are going to affect it, or um, periods of great calm are going to affect it. Um, but this is something that actually is, is, can be likened to and be compared to human resonance, which is a frequency as well. Um, let me try to explain this. Um, when we have emotional body reactions that are, that are stimulated by our heart or our brain, those can be measured by scientific instruments. And so what scientists, scientists are starting to grok now is that there are frequencies emitted from the earth that are not necessarily always weather related that could be a result of great human emotion or, or um, change that actually affect the electromagnetic vibration in our outer atmosphere. Okay. So, um, for instance, I'd just like to give, give a for instance. When I was um, studying with a teacher named Robert Goldswolf in 2005, he told us, oh, my God, the, um, the frequency of the earth is heightening. And he said, back in his day, he had heard that it was around 6 hertz. And then maybe in the 70s or 80s, it was around 7 and this was in 2005, he said, oh my God, it's, it, it's now measurable at seven hertz or eight. And that means that the, the frequency, the actual energy accumulating around the, um, the higher atmosphere than in the earth is increasing to move and vibrate and be stimulated at a higher level. So that begs the question, does the earth have consciousness and does the earth respond to our consciousness? Because what was, what was found out um, and actually measured in June of 2014, that um, our, our Earth's electromagnetic frequencies normally reside around the level of about 8.5 hertz. Now that's a clear two hertz above what they were at around 1970, 1980. So what is causing this? What is stimulating this? Um, it just so happens that the the electromagnetic frequencies surrounding the Earth in the Earth's magnetos electromagnetosphere liken the uh, frequencies of different brain states. Um, I put on this slide that a common 7.83 hertz frequency is likened to a human alpha theta state or a relaxed dreamlike state, a sort of neutral idling state waiting for something to happen. And then when the frequencies of the earth as well as our brain waves reach a 8.5 hertz frequency one moves out of the theta or dream state dreamy state into a full calmer more mindful wake, wakefulness called the alpha state with faster more alert beta frequencies starting to appear um, I'm not going to go into explanation about the brainwave states because I, again, I think that would be too laborious. But what this is saying is that the human mind and the human heart and human bodily processes are likening the Earth's um, measurable Schumann resonance frequencies, and they are both heightening at the same time. They have a direct correlation. And another thing that I want to add 
is that there's a direct correlation seemingly between the uh, Schumann resonance, which is the electromagnetic um, frequencies measured outside of the Earth's atmosphere. There's a direct correlation between these and also the sleep states of humans. Um, humans maintain a wakeful um, type of consciousness during the day that has a, a very high frequency. And when they're in the deep, deep lucid dream state or REM state, the frequency lowers to a, a much more um, a much more observable state, a very low frequency. And in between the wakefulness and the deep states is what's called a liminal state or a waking up state, where we receive all kinds of information because we're in, in between deep sleep and, and full wakefulness. And there's another state that we drift into as we're just falling asleep, which is called the hypnagogic state, which has a very restful, um, measurable um, human resonance wavelength. And there's another state that we attain when we're just waking up. It's called the hypnopompic state. And both the hypnagogic and the hypnopompic are very, very uh, suggestible states. They are very open to suggestive thought. Um, that's hence the word hypnagogic for hy hypnosis. And it's, it's thought that as Mother Earth is shifting her vibrational frequency, she is waking up from different sleep states and entering new awakenings, new level of consciousness, and allowing new ideas to percolate and seep through as we are all um, together consciously waking up during this time of great um, electricity, you might say, great heightened um, consciousness and great um, brain activity, and also great resting activity. Um, the difference between a resting sleep state um, frequency and a wake waking, human waking frequency is that the wavelength vibrates uh, stronger when you're wide awake, but just 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 as that occurs when we're very much asleep we are very much um impressionable to these two different um ideas coming into us and that way we can more apply them when we are fully awake so what is suggested to us when we are falling asleep and what comes to us in dreams becomes a creative seed and the creative process for our, ourselves to create during the waking hours. Uh, let's see here. Um, Jeffrey knew about these frequencies and he knew about heightening frequencies and he knew um, intuitively how they would link to our consciousness in the years to come. In the early 90s, he taught us that, quote, you'd better watch out friends. In the next few years, you're going to see such a buildup of synapses in the brain leading to such an impending explosion of dendrite formation that you'd better go ahead and put sand in those shoes. Just try and stay on the ground. And then he laughed. So um, like I said, we're, we have a lot of planetary um, conjunctions and um, ingresses going on now that have to do with Aquarius and Neptune and Pluto that help to heighten the energies on Earth as well as in the human mind and consciousness. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about Neptunian states. Um, we talked about this in length in the first um, presentation. So if you are of the mind to just go back and listen to that, even the beginning of it, you'd, you'd understand what um, Neptunian states are and how they come to us and how the messages are transferred to us and what, what what type of nature they represent. Um, I'll just say that it, at times throughout all of our lives, we receive messages from dreams, daydreams, meditation, or moments of super consciousness where we're alert of so much information at, this, at one time. Um, some of us may have received epiphany or directives from a near death or an out of body experience. That's a Neptune state, that's a Neptune um, directive. Some of us have found revelation in ecstatic nature experiences. I know I've done that many times. You have to kind of be at the right place at the right time to do that. 
um, most of the time these emotional responses to nature cannot be put into words. They are simply a direct communication from the totality of nature. And again, um, we talked in the first uh, presentation how Neptunian messages are ineffable, ineffable and indescribable. You really can't put them into words. It's more of a emotional feeling and it's very, very subtle, but it's very, very real. I've tried to transcribe it before and ha had, not, had not had much success. I try to just memorize the information and the, and the emotion that comes with it at the time and commit it to memory. Um, it's true that our spirit self is actually capable of traveling outside of the body when we're in deep, deep sleep or in an altered state. This is called astral projection. This is also a Neptunian state. Um, I did state in the first lecture that the most Neptunian states that we can experience in a, in a, as a body on Earth are the times when we're being born and the times when we're dying. Um, Jeffrey Retun re referred to dying as Neptuning out and referred to being born as Neptuning in. Shamans throughout the ages have used this technique to travel to different realities and bring back answers, cures, or directions for their tribe. Um, so all kinds of altered consciousness can be subscribed to different um, out, outer planets, specifically Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. But Neptune and Pluto tend to liken each other in many ways. Uh, Uranian messages, just for the um, just for the information, while we're on the topic, tend to be um, nonsensical, come out of nowhere. They can come like lightning bursts of insight. They can be very jarring. They can be very um, direct, and they can be very very verbal, as if you're actually hearing a voice. So these different differing transmissions that emanate to us from deep space, specifically Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto have to do with the different frequencies or wavelengths emitted from planets in their journey around our sun, um, that the wavelengths that are emitted to the earth, in short, um, a geocentric astrological chart that displays planetary patterns throughout our, li our lives. So when we look at a, a natal chart, we're looking at a geocentric um, view of that chart from the earth on out. And if we think of the most outermost planets of Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto um, receiving and transmitting emissions from deep space to us, that is exactly what's going on. And that's becoming more and more confirmed uh, in scientific terms as time goes by. Um, I'm just going to go through this one very quickly. Um, I'm a metaphysician. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a medical person. Um, all I know is what I feel. And it's a little bit hard to explain sometimes unless I'm in like-minded company. But everything is energy. Energy takes many forms and vibrates on many frequencies. To that, I'd like to add that there are as many levels of consciousness as there are life forms on the earth. Um, it's an, impossible to say that one person is more awakened than the other or lagging behind or so on and so forth, we, um, we have as many different forms of consciousness and levels of consciousness as there are um, sentient life forms walking or moving upon the Earth's surface. And there's no judgment involved in what type of consciousness level you uh, live in or swim in or fly in for that matter. Uh, the wisdom of our known universe is contained in the electromagnetics of dimensional reality. That's kind of a mouthful, but basically what we're finding out is that all information travels on light. Metaphysicians have known that forever, but we're now trying to, we're now starting to realize that there's some component of light energy that carries along with it information um, with a vibration from from deep space in terms of different forms of um, light energy and cosmic rays. They each have a different spirit and a different nature, and they each transmit different types of information to us that we are now trying to decipher. Um, the energy frequencies on Earth are heightening, are heightening for all life forms. So as we said before, a lot, lot, little of this will be redundant, but we've got to get through the nerdy stuff first before we get to the charts. 
um, as the earth resonance rises, and we can, we can measure it with instruments now, so does all life form of consciousness rise. That includes humans, animals, birds, uh, fish, um, everything that crawls on the earth, and it includes uh, the natural plant kingdom and the mineral kingdoms as well. What happens when the energy or a wavelength or thought form frequency heightens is that that understanding or that that awareness of consciousness heightens as well within the organism. Uh, many on earth today are awakening to a soul consciousness uh, independently and recognizing this form of enlightenment in each other. Um, most people on earth today are in e what we call ego consciousness from an evolutionary astrology perspective, meaning they're somewhat concerned with them, themselves and their lives and um, they kind of see the world revolving around them. But a lot of us are waking up to soul consciousness that it is something that pretty much has to be experienced to be explained. It's a feeling of all containment, you're part of everything, um, you go on forever, and everything that you do in your life, think and feel and attempt, has a repercussion across the universe. And you become a part of the fabric of the universe, and you realize that you have a very important niche in that fabric, that you're important, that you matter, and that your vibration will come back to you. You're a part of everything, and in a sense, everything is a part of you. Um, soul consciousness is the ability to see beyond an individual's ego-based wants and needs to the interconnected, interconnectedness, excuse me, interconnectedness of all life forms. There is no judgment on either part attributed to any level of consciousness from any life form to another. There's no judgment. Um, Jeffrey Green described soul consciousness as when the gravity of con our consciousness within the individual gravitates to the soul. This is a very lengthy process. It can take lifetimes. Normally what happens is um, most people and a lot of people that I know, we have inklings. We have um, every once in a while a window that opens to a reality that we can only dream about truly. Uh, Jeffrey described many of these, uh, these um, uh, inkling, inklings to us. And he had many of them. And um, it just means that every once in a while, you feel like the Venetian blinds are being pulled up in front of you. And you see out through a window that you always have been familiar with to a new vista. That's soul consciousness. Seeing what is around you that is beyond your normal realm of perception. Um, Jeffrey um, said that there is a form of soul consciousness that exists beyond um, or a form of, of consciousness that ex exists beyond soul consciousness. And that is a Neptunian based consciousness called unity consciousness, um, which is a Neptune principle that humans can only visit in their dreams and altered states. Um, and that cannot be fully attainable until after physical death. So Neptune unity consciousness is a feeling that you are one with all of nature. Many of us have glimpsed this, but to remain in that state would mean the dissolution of your physical body and the traveling of your spirit to a high, much higher realm. Neptune consciousness is the actual awareness of the consciousness is a very high vibration. And it's a, it's a vibration of the totality of the interrelatedness of all life forms on, on earth. Um, what we call Gaia, the interrelatedness and the interrelationship of all living life forms on earth. Neptune consciousness is a state of pure forgiveness and sheer and utter compassion. That's a little hard to grasp sometimes, but that's where we're headed. It's called home. Okay, let's see here. I will read the last sentence here. Neptune represents the perfect state of balance of nature, and nature is always seeking to attune itself to balance and harmony. I uh, had another Native American teacher named Red Eagle that taught us that. So um, 
We're all seeking home. We're all seeking to return. We're all seeking to remember in our dreams. It's just a natural way that humans function. And um, we're all seeking a, a natural state of balance and harmony. And that's what Neptune represents. Uh, let's see, Red Eagle gave us, gave us a, a saying that there is a seed at the root of all consciousness that shall not perish. Um, I'm not gonna read the whole saying, but I just wanted to say that he was teaching us in prose that there's a seed that persists in all of us. It's universally um, known. It persists lifetime to lifetime. It's a seed of awakening. Sometimes it lays buried or dormant. Sometimes it seems like it's dormant forever. Um, but it is the seed that is forced open by fire or cracked open or falls deepest into the earth that sings the loudest. And I'll never forget those words. It is a seed that is forced open by fire that sings the loudest. Um, he spoke the truth. And, you know, we've all had teachers and who we remember that um, taught us one thing or another, but their words were profound and we know that they were truly inspired. It wasn't long after he taught us that. That would have been in 92, before I met Jeffrey. Um, I went to a seminar with... Um, some very well-known spiritual authors and journalists and, and um, um, reporters. And I had a very deep conversation with a few of them who said, you know, I feel like I'm waking from a deep sleep. I feel like I just fell to earth this lifetime and I'm just starting to wake up. And if you um, subscribe to the theory of the yugas and what we call the great cycle of the great year, there are thousands upon thousands of years in a, in a yearly cycle, or, or thousands upon e eons and eons of years in the earthly cycle where civilization tends to fall asleep. And then when civilization tends to start to wake up, well, we're at the very end of the very densest <laughs> earthly cycle that is described in the Yuga year, uh, great year. And that's called the Kali cycle. And we are now awakening to uh, the beginning of enlightenment of a, of a grand new cycle where we're starting to truly wake up on earth. And um, Red Eagle's words in prose are so true that we are like seeds that have laid, laid dormant, but we're now starting to wake up. One of the, um, I might add to that, that one of the examples of super consciousness or hyper consciousness or heightened con consciousness is that you start to become aware of your of how conscious you are neptune is pure consciousness like the element water i spelled that wrong neptune consciousness has no shape of its own it takes on the form and reality of its container which in our case would be us our bodies it is when consciousness itself takes on form that it becomes conscious of the form it has taken this is called sentience. I am a spirit in a body. I walk the earth. Not all life forms have sentient recognition, however. It is a level of conscious um, awareness or evolution. We grow into it, in other words. The levels of consciousness among humans is truly unlimited. However, we metaphysicians discuss and define levels of consciousness that have appeared to us. These levels liken the sleep states that we know of. Know of that separate full waking awareness from the deep dream state. So we're gonna talk about Neptune a little bit and I want to show a chart of Pluto and Neptune. Pluto in this uh, diagram is the outer circle, Neptune is the inner circle. As you can see, they meet from time to time and coincide. Um, they, rep they both are our most outermost planets and they represent Earth-centered consciousness to the extent that we can understand it, to the extent that we can understand the archetypes of Neptune and Pluto, especially in, in EA terms. Um, we are, the, the confines of our consciousness was defined by Saturn up until the mid 1700s. Um, and now we've become much more aware and much more um, enlightened in our thinking and, and much more open-minded, I might add. 
Here again is the Pluto-Neptune orbits. Pluto is usually farthest from the sun. However, its orbit crosses inside of Neptune's orbit for 20 years every 248 years. So they combine, they combine conscious fields, let's say, conscious parameters. They intertwine, they work together as far as we are concerned from our little outpost on Earth. Pluto last crossed inside Neptune's orbit, orbit in 1979. And temporarily, temporarily, it became the eighth planet from the sun. Pluto crossed back over Neptune's orbit again in 1999, and it re resumed its place as the ninth planet from the sun for the next, tw and it will resume its place as the ninth planet from the sun for the next 228 years. Most planets only make small excursions in the vertical and ra radial directions, but Pluto is an exception. Pluto has a um, highly elliptical orbit, it reaches far into deep space, into the Kuiper belt. Um, and as far as we know, in a metaphysical sense, it is reaching and capturing all type of vibration, information, light, um, all types of cosmic rays, and redirecting, redirecting them back to the Earth via the sun. It's or the or orbit around the sun. <clears throat> so Pluto and Neptune do this dance, so to speak, and for the sake of our um, talk tonight, they're doing sort of a crossover dance of, of consciousness or consciousness rising or bringing consci consciousness, garnering and gathering consciousness to the earth out there in deep space. Pluto at times will move closer to the sun than Neptune, but it always, it is always well above the orbit of Neptune. When this happens, the orbits of the two planets never actually cross the same point in space. Um, Pluto gains higher uh, what you might call latitude expanse in its orbit of the sun. And in that sense, it's thought to be somewhat erratic, but it has the greatest um, extremes of any Earth, excuse me, of any planet's orbit in our solar system. And I think that somewhat speaks to the, um, the polarity effect that, that Pluto has on our very souls, the highs and lows that it brings um, to, to our soul's experience here on Earth. The metaphysics of Neptune, the higher oct octave, of course, of Venus is Neptune. Venus, from a Taurian perspective, represents a relationship to ourselves. Uh, do we value ourselves? Do we truly, truly value ourselves? That's a good question to ask ourselves. And where do we find hidden meaning in our lives? Those are a Taurian perspective. Venus, the inner relationship to ourselves, second house of Taurus. And then Venus from a Libra perspective teaches us to seek the, ex seek the exterior world of meaning through cultivating relationships and to seek balance in all interrelationship matters. So uh, Venus from a Libran perspective is the outer, is the outer um, archetype of Venus. And it teaches us to move beyond herself and to reach out to um, the outside world of relationships. There's a whole new world out there um, if you've been living in a Taurian perspective for a long time, which is pretty much um, self-contained. Neptune represents our personal communication with our God. And nature is God, and nature is seeking balance. This is a Diné teaching. Um, when I traveled in uh, Arizona, I was taught that nature equals beauty, equals balance, equals power. They're all synonyms for each other. But because we're speaking of Venus and Taurus and Libra and Neptune, they all have to do with the natural balance of the Earth, which can equate to beauty in native terms and also power because to be balanced is to walk in beauty and to walk in your natural personal power. As we personally attune and awaken to a higher consciousness, a higher vibration, voice, and perception, we simultaneously are attuning to a more soul-centered level of consciousness. The gravity of our consciousness naturally with life experience and conscious choice, migrates from an ego-based center of consciousness to a soul-based level. So whether we know it or not, by coming here and living a life on Earth, 
we are experiencing um, ego-centered consciousness. And in doing so, being aware that we're in a body on earth and we need to feed it and, and move around and work and take care of ourselves, um, we are automatically gravitating to, towards soul-centered consciousness, which is a higher level. And by automatically gravi or naturally gravitating to a soul-centered level of consciousness, we will ultimately uh, gravitate, gravitate to a Neptune-centered um, level of consciousness, which is a unity state. And that is a state when the, when the spirit actually leaves the body and returns to source or returns home. And that is a state that we can only visit in our dreams. Uh, Jeffrey Green said, we are progressively leaving behind a concept of man-made law. And we are progressively embracing the reality of natural law, which encompasses the reality of the interrelatedness of all life forms, or what we call Gaia. So by living on Earth, to, um, especially now, it's quite evident to many people, especially visionaries like Jeffrey, that by just being here and having life, life experiences in a human body, that we are learning to come into the flow of natural law, um, which is the basic balanced um, reality of nature. And um, we are progressively leaving behind, behind man-made law. Well, that gives us hope for the future. I hope that it happens soon. The planetary north node of Neptune is Leo. Every planet has a north node and a south node, just like this, the moon has a north node and a south node. But with the planets, um, we don't talk about them quite as much. But I, I do want to mention this because um, Leo represents or can represent in a north node um, sense the highly creative capacity of our very souls. Remember I said that when you dream, you create, you create from the heart. And it's when we're in our waking state that we can try to apply those dreams and, and um, believe in them and give our intent to them and give them shape and form. So um, Leo representing the very um, highest creative state possible for humans to, to um, live in. Is a, conscious, is a consciousness that um, is amorphic. Um, our intent affects synchronicity because we have a history or an understanding or proclivity toward the outcome. Um, when we put our intent towards something, whether it comes from a dream or a, a, a good movie or a beautiful melody or whatever it is, that intent concentrates and focuses our human creative power and gives it form. So Neptune is the beginning of that thought form and Leo is the archetype which helps to give it form. Leo, the creative capacity of the human being and the capacity of the, um, the power of the creative spirit of the human being to want to uh, create beauty or create harmony or create peace or to help other people, Leo is a very magnanimous, passionate archetype, and it wants to give and learn and do. It's a fire sign and create. Our souls in between lives have the seeding capability to awaken unconscious desires within us that can be made manifest. That's where Leo comes in, made manifest in the fourth dimensional realm, what we call reincarnation. So. Before we came here, in between lives, we had a dream. We had a dream of what we could do. We had a dream of what our creative self could create on earth. And we, ins we decided to take form to give um, power and fuel to those dreams. Um, the process is the same as awakening from a deep, deep sleep in which lucid dreaming has occurred. So the deeper the dreaming, the more intentful the actual application on earth to create what what your heart is dreaming of that's where these thoughts come from we are infinite infinitely creative beings that is a quote from david ike um 
one thing about Leo, and I'm going to speak the, the whole lecture today about people that are um, transitioning to a spiritual state of consciousness. One thing about Leo, when, when you relate it to a spiritual state of consciousness, is that it is actually a state of consciousness that comes from a deep unconscious state, but when fully awakened and applied in life, it is as if we are actually co-creating with God. And I'm not trying to be sacrilegious there. It's just that the, the awakened power of Leo creativity in a human is to realize that we can do anything that our heart desires that is in the, the greatest interest of um, humanity. And that is a high concept that, that we realize that, um, of course, we are powerless without God, but we are highly creativity in working in league and in sync with God. That's when our creativity is the most unleashed, when we realize that, hey, we have the power. We, we can do what our, what our heart is dreaming of. And not a lot of people allow themselves to, to believe that or think that way. Um, the oldest religion, um, oldest religions believe that God was nature. Neptune represents nature and balance, as we just, as we just discussed. <coughs> Excuse me. It is that breath of God, which is perceived in the deepest part of ourselves, our somatic body, like callings from the great cetaceans, a kind of soul sonar that becomes translated from the great beyond. And as um, Jeffrey used to refer to it on Neptune, it can be like a breath of fresh air um, amidst all perceivable chaos on earth. Um, Neptune is, again, is that ineffable, indescribable um, spirit that comes over us that gives us sheer inspiration um, to continue. And, and remember that the North Neptune, the planetary North Neptune for everybody on Earth, um, this entire generation and generations before us has and, and is and will be Leo for um, at least another thousand years. Okay, unlike Uranian messages, which tend to be voice-like, sudden, or specific, sometimes jarring, Neptunian messages are insistent, consistent, and very, very subtle. And they're more like a, a sensation or a breath or a pulse. Um, again, this is Jeffrey's quote. I put it in twice, I guess. But he said that um, in due time, and he's referring to the Aquarian Age, that we're transiting to, transitioning to right now, that there will be a gradual lessening of man-made law and a progressive embracing of natural law as we come to re recognize the truth of Gaia, that there exists absolute interrelationship between all forms of realities of life on Earth. Um, we're not going to get into sleep and, and brainwave states. We already kind of talked about that a little bit. But if you ever wonder why artists and creatives tend to be so creative, it's because they're very subliminal. Um, I am up all night. I'm a super creative. It's now five o'clock in the morning. And I normally watch the sun come up. And it's these liminal states that are kind of in between waking and sleeping where the ideas come and where you can remember them. Edgar Cayce worked with them. Vincent van Gogh referred to them. Salvador Dali. Um, actually, I know that Edgar Casey and Salvador Dali both employed sleep interruption, interruption techniques. Excuse my, my mouth, it's early or it's late, however you look at it. But they would both hold things in their hands and, until they started to fall asleep and it dropped and then they'd write down the thought that came to them. <clears throat> so altered states of consciousness are the same as altered states of brain waves and they also liken altered degrees of sleep stages. They're all subject, are they all subject to planetary influences? And if so, will the, will the predominantly state of ego consciousness on the planet today eventually yield to a state of soul consciousness? And is this accelerated by the advent of the Aquarian age? Moving right along here, I'm not going to talk about entrainment. I'm just going to move past this one. I'm just going to mention that entrainment is a musical um, um, teaching that um, whenever you play two notes together, musical notes, if 
they are the same note and the frequency is a little different. Say one guitar is not in, in tune, it's, it's tuned a half a note flat from another guitar. Then when you play them together, the ear will always hear the higher tone. So that's interesting when you think about what we just talked about in terms of the human resonance, the earth resonance, shared dreams, um, consciousness levels. When you're in a room with other people of higher consciousness, you're naturally going to gravitate within reason to that higher consciousness. It's not um, normal that a more dense form of consciousness would um, detract from a higher, a more higher consciousness um, group of people. Now, however, it does happen, and it is um, profound. But the higher consciousness, thank goodness, tends to entrain the lower consciousness or beseech the lower consciousness to rise to a higher level. And that is the way it is in human evolution. We tend to um, gain greater consciousness and higher consciousness and more spiritual consciousness as we gain more earthly life experience. It's called evolution. Um, I last talked about Tom Petty in my last lecture. And we're not going to really talk about him today. I'm just going to show you the chart. Um, I, and, and for good reason, and you'll see why in just a moment. Uh, Tom has what we call a Jupiter moon. If you look, um, let's see if I can do this. Look down here in the fourth house. He's got the moon in Aquarius and Jupiter retrograde in Aquarius. So what's happening in this chart is that the moon is moving this way through the zodiac. It's moving counterclockwise through the um, zodiacal wheel. Jupiter's retrograde when he was born. Jupiter's moving this way. It's moving clockwise through the zodiacal wheel. Then what's happening is they're actually somewhat colliding. <clears throat> Jupiter is applying pressure to that, that moon in Aquarius saying wake up and free yourself and individuate and and um be your own boss and believe what you want to believe and this is all in the fourth house of um deep internal emotional security so in many ways um he was waking up because this is also his pluto polarity point it, it opposes pluto in his chart he was waking up to um higher awareness to the emotional body big time um, he also had what we call, a, well, he has what we call a rebel moon, because when you have a moon that's affected by a retrograde planet, it tends to be, believe it or not, considered in a more rebellious mode than just a regular uh, moon uh, characteristic or, or description. And judging from his music, as you know, he was, uh, that was a constant theme of him, is, is rebellion and being a rebel and uh, so on and so forth. Um, another thing I want to point out in his chart is that the planetary ruler of the fourth house, which is um, in the sign of Aquarius, is um, in the eighth house. So here's Uranus, which is the planetary ruler of the fourth house. And um, so these, these, um, th these realities that he's experiencing th this lifetime are very much described, are, are most finely described by the planetary ruler of the fourth house, which is Aquarius. He has Aquarius in a generational sign of Uranus, and it is retrograde. So not only is he learning to be his own person in a familiar, familial sense, or in a deep inner emotional uh, secure sense, but he's also separating somewhat from his family in terms of separating from not really, you know, believing or going along with what his parents believe in and, and not really um, accepting the full model of the nuclear family. He's rebelling against an awful lot this time, this life, his lifetime. And he did have, <coughs> excuse me, Uranus retrograde as well. So he has, um, some very pr prominent retrogrades in his chart and because they are so uranian influence it means he is highly individuating this lifetime aquarius is the archetype of enlightenment 
that comes through higher perspective. What it represents what we call the higher mind, which is which can um, through Uranian perception and perhaps frequency uh, link up to the uh, vibrations emanated from the planet Uranus, which is a very um, high frequency and high uh, state of consciousness. Um, Aquarius represents the impulse to shed light, light on, t on issues that have been considered unresolved. And in this, in this case with um, Uranus in, in Cancer, lost my cursor, um, it is dealing with um, generational issues, dealing with families and biology. So all of the, these issues in terms of family, um, emotional content, emotional security, uh, who, I, who am I in, re in relation to my family, these are all coming up with him and they're all coming up with his generation because Uranus is in a sign for about um, seven years. And his music reflects that. His music is absolutely sublime and it reflects all of these generational concerns. And he had his own very real concerns with his family, specifically his father, um, not his mother, um, other that she died, other than that she died too, too young. But he uh, dealt with this generational issues very well. And I might add that he was a very, very good um, um, example of male healing. He did a lot of healing in his lifetime. He came to acceptance and forgiveness and compassion later in life and became what his um, guitar friend called um, a great, a, a kind Southern gentleman, a great Southern gentleman. And so he, he matured quite a lot emotionally in his lifetime. Okay, let's see here. Um, Neptune's placement can be where we are highly sensitive. So here he has Neptune in the 12th house. And it's in his sun stellium in the 12th house of Pisces. And it's in Libra. Uh, Neptune in Libra is another generational, um, art, uh, excuse me, signature. And Neptune is normally in a sign for about 14 years. <clears throat> So here's Neptune in Libra in the 12th house. And it's where we, we can be highly sensitive, where we can be psychically vulnerable, where we can be highly impressionable and perceive false fears or personal inadequacies. inadequacies. This certainly was his case. He uh, underestimated himself a lot and had some fault, admitted false fears and, and um, it, personal feelings of inadequacy that were absolutely unfounded. They weren't based on anything. But um, Neptune is where we're building natural immunity. So this Neptune here is highly vulnerable, highly impressionable. He was extremely psychic. He channeled. He called himself a, um, a diviner of music. He said it came from God. And in the lecture that I did before, we talked about these examples. Um, so here's Neptune in Libra, and Neptune in Libra being a generational signature can speak to people that are just waking up from a state of codependence or interdependence on other people and learning to in, in, individuate and differentiate from other people and what other people are projecting on them as a role and becoming their own unique innate individual. So he's in a highly individuating process this lifetime. And a lot of it is predicated on learning counterpoint awareness because he has a stellium in, in Libra. It's saying, I'm not the other person. I'm not my teacher. I'm not my lover. I'm not my dad. I'm not my mom. I'm not my brother, my sister. I'm not my friend. I am uniquely and innately myself. And that's what a lot of the Neptune and Libra generation is waking up to, especially people of higher consciousness, and he certainly was one. He was um, considered third state individuated, trans transitioning to first stage spiritual. And you can see it in the story of his life. You can actually see the progression in the story of his life. Okay, so let's move on here. Um, remember the quote that Red Eagle gave us about forcing the seed? Well, what he was actually saying, whether he knew it or not, he was speaking of evolution. And because great teachers all share universal, timeless wisdom, 
that is a Neptune concept. And any great teacher will liken another and another and another if they are truly inspired. They're just going to word it differently. So um, Red Eagle talked about forcing the seed. He said it's the seed that is forced open by fire that sings the loudest. And um, Jeffrey taught us that one of the fastest ways to evolve is to do, pursue, immerse yourself in that which fascinates you. No matter how hard it is, whatever compels you uh, outside of your existing current, current li limits of interest or belief or knowledge is that which is going to take you the furthest. Um, there's a reason for us to be fascinated or obsessed in a good way with people or things or movies or books or performances or music or places or things or natural natural places you know or animals whatever it is there's a reason for that fascination as long as it is healthy follow it that's a neptune principle of um doing what is put before you and working hard at it studying and applying that's what you're obsessed with because nature is trying to pull you out of yourself so that you can serve the higher higher good So here's our next chart. We're going to take a break in just a moment because we are at an hour. Oh my God. Um, we're going to take a break in just a moment, but I want to show you this chart. This is a chart that I came across that um, grabbed my interest. I became obsessed with um, because I just looked into it and I realized, oh my goodness, he was born in 1950. Tom Petty was born in 1950. And I have a very healthy obsession with him and his music and his genius. And this individual passed away in 2017. Tom Petty passed away in 2017. So then little lights are going on in my brain thinking, ding, ding, ding. You know, you better look into this. This is a sign. This could be a Neptunian prodding. This could be a whisper from eternity or the universe to me to help uh, relay to you. Um, you know, there are no coincidences, right? So looking at this chart, I thought, well, what are the, what are the um, contrasts and comparisons here? Well, Benny was born to a lower middle class, working class family. He had no specific religious upbringing, but he did attend a Protestant church as a young child with his grandparents who were religious and had a wonderful effect on him, by the way. It was a wonderful experience for him. He too, along with Tom Petty, is considered to be in the third stage individuated, meaning he's highly, highly individuated in this lifetime. He's not listening, listening to anyone else. He's becoming his own person. He's coming, he's coming to realize who his true innate um, identity really is. Not that he ever lost it, but we have a tendency to forget. Um, he is transitioning to first stage spiritual this lifetime. And that can be somewhat nebulous for an astrologer. It's kind of hard to tell unless you really listen to a person, listen to their questions and listen to their answers as they speak about themselves. To me, to perceive that someone is transitioning to first stage spiritual is really a vibe. And the more I learn about Benny's life, the more I am absolutely confirmed that he is because I can see a progression to that, to that state and, and um, the way he explains his life and tells me or tells others what he is truly interested in. Um, Pluto is retrograde in Leo in this chart. Here's Pluto in the second house. And um, so he has... To begin with, right off the bat, a highly rebellious na uh, nature. Pluto is retrograde half of the year, so half of us have that highly retrograde na uh, nature. When Pluto is retrograde, it forces the issue toward the opposite house. Retrogrades force the issue toward the archetype and, and, and the house that they oppose. Because he is learning to individuate so quickly on a soul level, in terms of um, 
his, his deepest soul intentions this lifetime and his desires of his soul. He's doing it so radically and so quickly and so independently that it forces and it accelerates evolution. It's sort of a state of evolutionary unrest and it forces the um, archetype of this Pluto in Leo in the second house toward the eighth house um, ruled by Aquarius. So this is the level that his soul came in on this lifetime, is Pluto in the second house in Leo. He's definitely um, dealing with self-love, self-confidence, um, self-sustainment issues. He's definitely been learning for a long time how to take care of himself, how to be self, self-sufficient. Um, and he's learning, like I said, self-confidence this lifetime. And um, um, really, um, really finishing that up because the house that Pluto is in tends to purge a house and it tends to propel the energy of that house or that signature toward the opposite house. So he's been pretty much self-contained. He's, he's, he's independent. Like I said, he's self-sufficient. He knows how to take care of himself. Um, but because Pluto is here, he's going to experience the, the highest um, highs and lows this lifetime in the second house. That means he's going to doubt his self-control, his self-confidence, his self-esteem, his self-love. He's going to doubt his values. He's going to doubt, doubt the um, hidden the meaning that he gives to life. And it's going to be extreme highs and lows, sort of like um, contractions or birth pangs that forces um, this signature here or this story, I keep losing my cursor, this signature into the eighth house of Aquarius of higher mindedness and higher understanding. And because it's Pluto in the second house um, and the Pluto polarity point is in the eighth house, that means that he's in a highly, um, he, he really wants to evolve. He really wants to move out of what he knows about himself and what he's learned about himself and how he knows to take care of himself and and um, uh, do what he needs to do and follow his, um, his natural um, interests in life. And he's evolving way beyond that into the, into the unknown, so to speak, the eighth house ruled by Uranus. And one thing I also want to point out is that I noticed that this Pluto here is conjunct what we call the planetary planetary north node of Neptune. Remember we said the planetary north node of Neptune for everyone on the earth this century, uh, last century and this century combined, is Leo. So what Benny is learning is to believe in his own creative powers, his own innate creative powers. He's coming to value them. He's coming to trust them. He's coming to actually um, carry them and commit them to the, the deepest part of himself on a soul level, something he can never lose. And what, when I see this signature, because I've been doing readings, I've been a counseling astrologer for 26 years. When I see this, I actually see someone who's coming to learn to parent themselves. They're picking themselves up by the bootstraps and saying, I am fantastic. I'm remarkable. I am shiny and brand new and and you know uh something to behold because a lot of what leo gives us especially in the second house of self-worth and self-value is the ability to recreate our lives no matter what our parents handed us its ability to um find self-purpose creative self-purpose and special destiny and really feel like we are that golden child no matter what our parents did or did not give to us. We're rebirthing ourselves, we're believing ourselves, we're patting ourselves on the head. Um, Pluto and Leo is really rebirthing ourselves. And the way that I explain this is um, in the color purple, the character that uh, Whoopi Goldberg played stood up at one point in the movie and said, I may be poor, I may be black, I may even be a woman, but I'm here, damn it, I'm here. And Pluto and Leo, says, I am a fourth force to be reckoned with. I am here. I, I, I deserve to live. I am reclaiming my birthright. I am a force to be reckoned with. And he, Benny did just that. He would never give up, no matter what was thrown at him, no matter what was handed to him over and over again. 
he got back up and he went out there and fought and he defended his life and his creativity. And his life was predicated on creativity. I might say it was fueled by productivity. So this kind of gives an example of that seed that gets forced open through hardship. It propels us to the opposite sign to, to evolve. Everything must evolve. And um, here, if we look at the eighth house, the Pluto polarity point, the ruling uh, the planetary ruler of the eighth house is Uranus, right here in the twelfth house. So he has come back this lifetime to evolve as much as he can, as much as he can fathom. It's it's a it's a very hard life he chose this lifetime. It's full of ups and downs, but he's come to really force the seed, which is um, the planetary ruler of the eighth house, which is Uranus, to highly individuate this lifetime. And similar to uh, the generational uh, signatures you saw in Tim's chart, he's learning to individuate this lifetime. He's got, they both have Uranus in, in Cancer, and Benny's Uranus happens to be in the 12th house, meaning he's left it out for a long time, but he's coming to individuate this lifetime, coming to feel his own em emotions, to um, uh, own his own emotions, and he's going through a lot of male healing this lifetime, and what it means to be a, a human in a male body, and have healthy emotions be able to express himself and, and laugh and cry and emote and um, um, really open up and relate what he's feeling. Okay, so um, Pluto's in the, in the second house. Um, Venus is in Pisces in uh, the ninth house of Sagittarius. And I just want to point out real quickly that the south node of Venus is right here in, in um, uh, Pis Pisces as well. The north node of Venus is right here in Taurus. So let's look at that quickly. With the south node of Venus in Pisces, that means that the way that uh, Benny has been relating for lifetimes and lifetimes is silent and intuitive. And it's in the ninth house of silent intuitive communication. So um, let's see if I have this written down. It means that he's learning to express himself and really open up and talk this lifetime because being a self node, the way we used to relate and the culture that we used to live in and the way we communicated is, is very much um, seen and symbolized by the self node of Venus. And he's right, right now, this lifetime in a Venus in Piscean state as well. So he, he really has learned to relate to, like I said, silent intuitive communication, being that this Venus is conjunct his moon and Jupiter in the ninth house of instinctual activity and sort of um, an animalistic type of approach to things where you just, you, you have um, a wild nature and you learn to relate um, to that wild nature and not conform to societal mores or, um, societal conditioning. You just tend to be more of a renegade and on the outskirts and someone on the outside looking in and not do too well specifically in polite society. So looking at this, um, I want to uh, talk about a quote from Jeffrey right over here that says that that spoke to the Venus South Node signature. When you look at the Venus planetary South Node signature in your chart, he said, it can be, a, a, it can, it is a feeling of not feeling at home in the society of your birth. This is exactly when the soul begins to detach Uranus from the time and place that it lives, meaning consciousness is expanding, it's evolving to embrace a larger whole than just the immediacy of its own specific existence. So what he's saying here is that when you look at Venus specifically, because it stands for societies and cultures and, inter and relating and, and um, relationships, because uh, Benny has the South Node in Pisces, which is really just a state of being. It's not a state of high communication. It's more just letting things be. Um, one of the um, examples I give to that is The Fool on the Hill, um, the Beatles song. But it's just, it's just being and observing. It's being 
an outsider and not judging, but just taking it all in and taking note of things, um, a conscious witness. And so he does not relate well um, in polite society. He called himself a social idiot. He really got himself hurt a lot um, in different societal situations. It's, it's heartbreaking, the story, but um he he had a good relationship with himself let's put it that way and he knew how to relate to close friends and his family and he's learning north node venus um he's learning to really relate to himself and and he's been going through a lot of psychoanalysis this lifetime and he's learning how he can best relate to himself so that he can better open up and communicate to others. So he's doing the work on his for himself first so that he can heal on an inner level and better teach and be a better representation um, and role model to others. He's doing the work on, on, on himself right now this lifetime. <clears throat> so um, he's got an Aquarius moon conjunct Jupiter the same as Tom Petty. It's in a different configuration. Jupiter here is approaching, it's culminating to his moon in Aquarius, which meaning that it's bringing something very, very special um, in terms of realization of wildness and wild nature and instinctual, the instinctual mind, the right brain, the conceptual brain, the symbolic brain. I um, always think of the ninth house as a very, um, shamanic experience, somebody who's learning to read the signs and symbols that are all around them. So he's a bit of a magician, this, this gentleman. And um, let's see what else I said about him. But he does share this signature. He has the same Aquarius moon and he has Jupiter conjunct Aquarius moon because Jupiter is a, is a generational signature as well. It's in a sign for about a year. Um, and again, I want to mention that my, my friend Ari talked about the ninth house and the ninth house quincunx in his last lecture, Belief and Knowledge. And I have the ninth house forms a natural quincunx right here to the second house and the fourth house. And what the ninth house does in terms of wildness and the call of the wild is it calls us out from our very comfortable physical state of being. I have a home and an existence, sort of a hobbit type of existence. I'm not gonna leave, I'm comfortable, I don't wanna venture out. It calls us away from there um, and to a, with a voice from, you know, beyond the gate, a voice that is from the wildness and pulls us out of our very staid and uh, sometimes confined world into a broader world, an expansive world. And it also cal calls us out from the confines of emotional um, stagnancy. And it calls us out to experience and widen our, you know, take some chances and, and uh, be more vulnerable and, and relate to other forms of life and form relationships with all forms of life, not just humans, but to relate to everything, um, sky's the limit. And I had told Ari that I d have always called this this yod, ninth house yod, Jupiter yod, Sagittarius yod, the horse at the gate, because really the way that I remember this yod is that if there's a horse at the gate, <clears throat> a wild creature that represents natural law and wildness and freedom, um, it will pull you from your home, it'll pull you from your your isolated states of um, emotion where you feel like you're alone and you can't grow and you're stuck and, and afraid and isolated. So that's a lot of what this ninth house does for Benny as well. In fact, it is this ninth, ninth house that saved him this lifetime. I'm gonna speed it up here. Um, he had a life of extremes. We've already talked about that. And we looked at Pluto and I do want to relate that Jeffrey said that the natal position of your Pluto at birth by house and sign is showing you directly correlates with what the prior life evolutionary desires have been, what has been emphasized in that soul's consciousness prior to the current life. So Benny is growing from self-containment, self-sufficiency, uh, you know, a, a self-contained world where he's figured out how to take care of himself He's been working on himself for a very long time. He's venturing out into the great unknown. 
this lifetime. He's going to experience all kinds of extremes, experiences, highs and lows in life. But he wants to broaden his life this lifetime. He wants to grow and evolve this lifetime. And he wants to learn that which is absolutely essential in life. And because I'm going to try to speed this up, he did find out what was absolutely essential in life. He said it was his home, his family, his close friends, and his animals. He said love is everything. And quite a few times in his life, as did um, Tom, for that matter, he lost everything he had. <clears throat> and that forced, really forced that realization that all you have is love. Um, he's evolving his inner relationship with himself to extend to others and broader applications and broader expansion, expansion of uh, the love principle. He's learning to open up himself and give to others more, not just protect himself. And when we look at the Pluto placement in a chart, which represents our soul, and the Pluto polarity point, which represents a trajectory, uh, tra tra trajectory um, um, direction for our soul this lifetime, um, we are looking at why we reincarnated. Why did we come back at this time? And I have to ask myself, why did Benny come back at the same time as Tom Petty? Well, there are parallels, and we'll look at that in just a moment. But in the, in the fastest way that I can explain it is that we all travel on buses. We all travel in the same boat, boats. A lot of the times when we have similar karmic signatures, we come back during the same generation, and we might even have a similar life story. It's because of karmic patterns. We've known each other in lifetimes. We've been in, in a similar life situation in a, life, in a past lifetime, and we've, we, we, we have either known of each other, each other in some form, or we've been aware of each other, or we've traveled in the same circles, and we've come back on, on a similar pattern, a similar um, life pattern that has the same trajectory course and the same origins, and we're trying to evolve in very similar ways. And why did we come back now? Because the time was right, and the stars were right, and the uh, planetary influences was, were right, and Nine times out of ten, we either, either knew each other or knew of each other or traveled in the same circles or endured similar circumstances. That's why we come back and share signatures. There's a mutuality there somewhere. And um, so this is the why he came back. When we look at the planetary notes, we see how he's evolving. And he's evolving from the from a very um, from the house of Cancer to the house of uh, Capricorn. He's developing the mature body this lifetime. He's a, developing emotional maturity and objectivity this lifetime. He is learning to be a role model. He's learning to be strong. He's learning to be assertive. He's already been in a family situation many many lifetimes. North South Node is quite literal. Um, and then let's look at this as well. You've got the south node in Neptune in the fourth house. Neptune's retrograde. And they're both in Libra. Has he been codependent in the, life, in the past life? Has he been codependent on other family members? Has he been considered the, the baby in past lives? Perhaps the pampered one? Perhaps a little prince? Um, in short, with south node um, traveling or... or um, projecting onto the south node in fourth house, projecting to the north node in Aries in the 10th house this lifetime, he's giving himself permission to be the incredible burst of creative inspiration to others that he was meant to be. This is a highly creative signature here in the 10th house. Um, the times I've seen it, it tends to be quite political as well. But he's giving himself the permission and the authority to develop emotional maturity and be the bright light that he was meant to be to others and a, and a light of inspiration. So you see how our personal evolution is very, which is typified or signified by Pluto, is very much in league with the mind of God or Gaia, which is symbolized by Neptune. Our lives are not our own. We are meant to evolve for a reason so we can serve others and serve a higher purpose.
<clears throat> okay. Um, really going to speed it up here. So Benny has a highly retrograde personality. He has um, actually six retrogrades in the chart, but I'm only reading five of them. He has Pluto retrograde. He has Saturn retrograde. He has um, Juno retrograde, but I'm not really going to look at that. Um, he has Mars retrograde. He has Neptune retrograde. So he actually has five with Chiron retrograde. One, two, three, four, five of the planets or the major asteroids in retrograde. He has a highly retrograde personality. And you'll find with retrogrades, because they are redos in a chart, that um, the universe or God or Gaia or whatever you believe in is trying to force the lesson. It's, it's repeating themes so that you'll really get them well, so that you'll internalize them, internalize them on a bodily somatic level. They'll never leave you. You can never lose them. Um, and also when you see a highly retrograde chart, you're going to see these themes, these retrograde themes repeat again and again in a chart. It's almost like the universe is saying, do you get it? Do you get it this lifetime? Are you getting it? Is it sinking in? Um, highly retrograde lifetimes are lifetimes of unrest. They're a lifetime of upheaval, of, of quickening, of fast learning. Retrogrades quicken evolution. Um, like I said, they can really f force the issue and drive the lesson home. So let's look at this quickly. Um, he has more than four retrogrades, so he's learning how to decondition from patriarchal uh, belief systems and, and patterns and what he's been told. That, that's it in a, in a real nutshell. He's de deconditioning rapidly this lifetime. He's learning counterpoint awareness, like we said. He's not another person. He's not another teacher. He's not, an, not another lover, lover, another family member, another friend. He's be learning to understand who he is as an innate individual. Um, he's also a sun sign Aries. And I want to point out that whenever you see a retrograde, uh, a planet in a retrograde, retrograde stands for two archetypes, and they are the um, Aries archetype and the Iranian archetype. Aries archetype is to be the unique individual and find your individuality and be independent and be instinctual and, and you know, follow your own uh, path. And Uranian archetype is to decondition and liberate from all past forms of conditioning, what you've been told, what you've been told to, to believe, how you've been told to behave. So <clears throat> because um, he is a Aries son, which is teaching him to be highly independent and regain his unique um, original or, or, or keep his originality and his uniqueness and never lose it. And he has a, Aquarian moon conjunct Jupiter and Aquarius. This is one of the most highly individuating charts I've ever seen. Um, he's had a tough life, but um, I remember Jeffrey saying um, something about a combination between Aries and Aquarius and the uh, impulse to individuate in a lifetime and how it can be quickened and accelerated. And he said, <clears throat> you wouldn't dare tell a person like with, with these two signatures, that they are just like everyone else. If you want to see some real Aries anger and you want to know what the um, sign of the symbol of the ram really stands for, um, I would not tell this individual that he's just like everyone else and he's a conformist and um, he's doing what everybody else is doing. He, he's not. He's, his whole purpose to live is to be different and to create and to, um, you know, be his own person, so to speak. Jeffrey had said that when we decondition against that which we are not, we are simultaneously growing into our true individuated selves. It's like taking layers off an onion. So what, as you can see what Benny is doing here is he's removing the layers of conditioning from past lives, from past influences, a lot of family conditioning, probably a lot of legacy, a lot of what was handed down. And he shares with Tom Petty a real struggle with his dad. Not that other people haven't. Most people can relate to struggle with a parent of one form or another, but um, they have a they have they both have the south node applying pressure to um, Saturn in their charts, and that means that they are learning to come to grapple 
with not only this lifetime, um, what you might call uh, fatherly abuse or fatherly, even fatherly neglect, but they're coming to grapple with lifetimes of either accepting that or enduring that or not being able to stand up to it. In short, they're stopping the cycle of abuse this lifetime, they're stopping the buck. Um, so that's something that they have in common that I found very interesting and it certainly does relate to both of their life stories. Um, let's see, as we consciously enter into the process of deconditioning from what we truly know that we are not to what we truly know that we are, the Uranian process of counterpoint awareness, our whole reality structure starts to change. We simultaneously enter into the realm of possibilities of what we can be and the possibilities of expanding and opening up to soul consciousness and realizing that we are a soul in a body expanding from life to life and that we are beginning to see the interrelatedness of all life forms or what we call Gaia. <clears throat> so through this yod, uh, this higher awareness and awakening in the ninth house, again, he may have been felt trapped or stifled in the second house, trapped or stifled in the, in the fourth house. He's uh, really dealing with his emotions and his emotional security this lifetime. And uh, the outlet is right here in the ninth house. And Benny relates better to animals than any, anything else on earth. He's a huge animal lover. They are his refuge <clears throat> and his sanctuary. Okay. Um, so he has a second house Pluto. Um, the sign on the second, on the second house cusp, Leo, uh, is what Jeffrey calls your natural voice. So his natural voice, his natural magnetism, um, what he uh, emits and how he attracts other people is Leo. And Leo, Leo's planetary ruler is the sun. So does this man have something to say? You better believe it. He's got a voice that, that is just screaming to be heard. So um, he's dealing with huge loss, abandonment, and betrayal issues this lifetime, Pluto in the second house, huge father issues. Um, he takes all forms of rejection personally, but he doesn't give up. He's experienced extreme highs and lows this lifetime. Um, and during the lows, he retreats to his room for days, questioning his worthiness and right to be here, Leo. So here's his past. Here's Leo where it came in. Here's where he would retreat to his, his own room or behind closed doors and just shut himself off from the world. Well, nature and the universe aren't gonna allow that any longer. He's got a voice that needs to be heard and he needs to um, open up and um, take some risks and, and fill those feelings and really let his, his soul loose and let it expand in the real world, the eighth world of um, mystery and the unknown and explore what's, what scares him. The eighth house is, it contains the lies of, laws of life and death. And it also it is, the eighth house is a um, vibration that does not really speak to the common norms and values of polite society. So he's learning to challenge everything that he's thought kept him safe and contained in a personal level. And he's learning to express himself in more open and um, socially challenging ways, let's put it that way. The eighth house is a real social taboo buster. It, it tries to uh, break loose and bust open any societal norms. Um, Benny is rebirthing him like himself this lifetime. That's a Leo principle. And in so many ways, he's doing that. Um, he's rebirthing his right to love himself, uh, feel self-confident and shiny and special. He's rebirthing his self-respect and really come to value himself and his God-given talents. <clears throat> okay. And then I did circle the sign on the 12th house cusp as well. Jeffrey calls this our, our um, ultimate ideals, our ultimate values or ultimate life's purpose. And the sign on the 12th house cusp of Neptune, which represents God, in his case is Gemini. And um, that, that symbolizes that he's yearning for 
a direct connection and a, and a direct communication with his creator right here on the 12th house cusp. The planetary ruler of Gemini is Mercury in the 11th house. So again, he's coming into a dialogue with himself, an open, sincere um, dialogue with himself. He's learning emotional uh, maturity. He's learning emotional integrity. Um, and um, he's coming to do the work on himself this lifetime and really open up and admit things to himself through its, through its intense self-analysis so that he can better be a better help to others. Um, one of my teachers, Robert Goldsworth, taught us that you cannot begin to affect or heal or touch another person until you do the work on yourself. So real quickly, some of his soul lessons. If you look at the fourth house, again, this is a very familial um, realm here. And he has um, Neptune in the fourth house retrograde. He's highly, he's highly um, impressionable. Um, he has a lot of self-doubt. He beats himself up again a, a lot. And the, at the same time, he's very psychic. He's like a psychic sponge. He's an empath. He really... Um, has to watch who he's around because he'll he'll try to help them and heal them. He's learned to just, you know, keep that in check. He's been a fixer all his life. He tries to help other people, Neptune and Libra, Libra re retrograde. Um, let's see. He's also an escape artist. He's done his work, his share of um, alcohol and drugs. But um, at the height of his career, he had to leave the uh, social scene and he had to leave the accoutrements of success because he was said he was dying inside emotionally. So Neptune in the fourth house, which is oftentimes considered the foundation of the chart, the foundation of the outer life, is telling him to pull back the reins, pull back, seek nature, be with animals, be alone, be quiet. Um, seek to evolve, but not so much in the public eye. Um, let's see, he's extremely uh, vulnerable emotionally. Um, and this is um, emotional patterns that he has learned from past and past lives. He's been codependent in past lives. Um, let's see, he's either thought that he could save other people or they could save him, but the codependency is quite obvious in his signature. And um, Let's just go ahead and move on. I just want to mention he's got Virgo here too, Mars and Virgo, which is the nature of personal desire. It's sort of the messenger of Pluto and Pluto's intention to evolve this lifetime, along with uh, uh, Saturn in, in Virgo retrograde. So what he's doing this lifetime with, with this um, stellium here in Virgo is he's undoing a lot of tapes in his mind that said, you're not good enough, you'll never make it. Uh, in this case, they were tapes from his father. Um, his father was emotionally and psychologically abusive and verbally abusive. So he's undoing those tapes and he's telling himself through you know, analysis and, and help that he is good enough and he can make it and he is um, deserving of, of happiness and personal um, emotional wealth and security. And also, um, Steve Wolfson pointed something else in, out in terms of Virgo and um, Mercury retrograde signatures and the third house. And he said, this can be a signature involving Virgo or Mercury retrograde or the third house where we are learning to rewire our nervous system. We are learning to reprogram our nervous system. We are learning to sit when we have been shunned or denied or put down or shut down. And instead of um, checking out or closing the door or not, or not responding, we can sit with ourselves and say, you are good enough, you will make it. Just get through these, these few moments, pick yourself up, dust yourself off. You have all the stuff that you need to make it. Reprogramming, rewiring re the mind. The moon and its nodes, we already talked about this, so I'm not going to go there. 
but I will say that Benny is finishing up healing of unresolved emotional lessons this lifetime, and he's learning to uh, carry his own inner emotional security. He's finding it in himself. He didn't, um, his mother was a wonderful, caring, loving woman, but she had her own concerns. His father was emotionally, psychologically, and verbally abusive. He's finding emotional security in his own life, in his own self this lifetime, and carrying it into the outside world so that he can be stronger, um, forced to be recognized in the outside world and be a better father and a better role model to other others and a better example to others, that they can follow and do the same thing. I'm going to break here for a moment and um, take a break and I'll be right back. Stay with us.